Today on an all-new Dr. Phil, she's the daughter of the BTK serial killer. I don't know BTK. I know my dad. You were a daddy's girl. He actually taught you about stranger danger. He taught me how to fight off a man because he had done this to other people. Never before revealed details. Carrie has never read her father's letters publicly before. He wrote this a month after he pled guilty to 10 murders, including two children. If he were out today, do you think he would kill again? Yeah, he was planning one right before he was arrested. So you wouldn't trust him? Oh, God, no. He's my dad, but I'm also scared to death of him. Well, I have a mini project you're all going to help me with today. I want to create a man that many people might consider just absolutely ideal. He's on the screen here. This man is tall, he's college educated, served in the military, is a hands-on dad, good provider, churchgoer, Cub Scout leader, outdoorsman. What do you think so far? Sound like a decent kind of guy? If you were in the dating world, is this the kind of guy you would date? If so, stand up. Just based on what you know. Okay. How about being marriage candidates? Is this the kind of person you'd say, okay, you'd marry, remain standing. Okay. And stand up if you think that he would be a great father. Right. Still, good. Outdoorsman, Cub Scout leader involved, right? A lot of you seem to think, definitely great guy. This ideal man actually exists. His name is Dennis. But Dennis, with all of these great qualities, all these things that we just listed, is also known as the BTK Strangler. BTK stands for Bind, Torture, and Kill. Dennis is a notorious serial killer who murdered people for three decades, and this is what he said in court about murdering his first victims, parents and their two small children. Stalking and murder in Wichita, Kansas. For three decades, Wichita, Kansas has lived with a murder mystery. This case involves at least 10 murders by a man who, in letters to police, called himself a monster. The serial killer who nicknamed himself BTK. Bind them, torture them, kill them. 10 victims strangled without mercy. We have torture devices. He commented to me at one point, I'm sorry, I know this is a human being, but I'm a monster. January 1974, four members of the Otero family are tied up and strangled, including two children, nine-year-old Joseph and 11-year-old Josephine, who is hanged from a basement pipe. What did you do to Joseph Otero? I put a plastic bag over his head and then some cords and then tighten it. This is Otero. I had never strangled anyone before, so I really didn't know how much pressure you had to put on a person or how long it would take. And I strangled uh, Josephine. She passed out and then uh, put a bag on uh, Junior's head. Josephine woke back up and I took her to the basement and hung her. I opened up the door of the kitchen, the back door. I ran down a hall opened the door and looked and saw my mom and my dad there. My dad's tongue was halfway bit off. He had a, a belt around his neck. My mom was beaten. Felt like physically having your chest ripped open and your heart pulled out. It changed my life instantly. Three months later, BTK struck again. His next victim was Catherine Bright, who he had never seen before the day he drove by and saw her entering her home. Then he broke in, and when strangulation didn't work, he stabbed her two to three times in her side and back. Three years later, when BTK entered Shirley Vian Relford's home, he actually told her he planned to tie her up so he would need to put her children in another room. So BTK got the woman's kids settled in the bathroom with toys and blankets and then put a bag over her head and then strangled her to death. 
And when his wife was pregnant with his second child, a daughter, he was out murdering his seventh victim, Nancy Fox. December 1977, BTK bound and strangled 25-year-old Nancy Fox and added a twist. He reported the murder to police himself. You will find a homicide at 43 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. Then the killer sent a chilling letter to a local TV station that read in part, how many do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? Nancy Fox broke in, told her to have to tie her up and have sex with her. I took the belt and then strangled her. As BTK killed his sixth victim, his wife Paula Rader was pregnant with the couple's second child, a daughter. Now, while Dennis sat at the dinner table with his pregnant wife, she had no idea that the hands he used to hug her when he returned home were the same hands he used to wrap around his victim's necks and strangle them to death. His wife's unborn baby ended up being a little girl who grew up to be a self-professed daddy's girl. Well, we're gonna talk to her about being a serial killer's daughter after the break. Two of you shared an interest in killer movies. Here's a man that's out doing this. He's out killing people. And he's coming home to his daughter and saying, let's go watch Silence of the Lambs. The 31-year-long manhunt for the BTK killer is over. BTK is arrested. Investigators say the so-called BTK killer who terrorized residents of Wichita has been linked by DNA evidence to the murders. BTK serial killer was finally sentenced today. Will you, Dennis L. Rader, be taken by the sheriff of Sedgwick County? The judge gave Rader the maximum sentence, 175 years. Please welcome Carrie Rawson, the author of A Serial Killer's Daughter. My story of faith, love, and overcoming. Her father, Dennis Rader, a serial killer known as BTK, is currently serving 10 life sentences for killing eight adults and two children in a murder spree that terrorized Wichita, Kansas from 1974 to 1991. You said that at first you tried to alibi. Yeah your father. I was 26 in 2005 when what? the FBI knocked on my door to tell me that my father had been arrested and they said they thought he was BTK and so I was worried something had happened to my mom or my grandma because BTK strangled women that lived alone and they're like no we're trying to tell you your father is BTK and so then I was like no you have the wrong man because you know he was a church volunteer and a boy scout leader and like the man that I loved. And I'm like showing him the picture of him on the wall saying, you've got that picture right there, Right. you know. So, and you were a daddy's girl and yeah. he was your best friend. Right. This was someone you looked up to every day. Right. In looking back, even now, in looking back, were there any red flags? A few times when I was older, when I was 18, my brother was 21, we got into a family fight. I had been home from college. My mom had made a nice dinner and we got into a fight and we broke the table and um, my dad lunged at my brother like straight on and tried to strangle my brother at dinner. And, just out of the blue. And now my dad is just not even looking like my dad physically in his eyes, like he's just someone else. And then he, my dad like got dejected and hung his head and he said he was sorry and you could kind of see him come back to the guy I knew. Do you think in retrospect that during that moment BTK flashed in your father? Um, in retrospect, when I can see what my father looked like in court, you can see like the eyes narrow and get darker. And like my father had a lot of internal rage when he came after my brother and he didn't look like the man I knew. So I would say that's probably the closest I got to BTK, but I have a hard time calling my dad BTK because he's just my dad. Right. Now he actually taught you about stranger danger. As a teenager, when he was teaching me to drive, he taught me how to like fight off a man and he taught me how to carry my key and I still do it. When you come to find out who your father is and then you realize he was teaching you these things because he had done this to other people, it like 
it destroys you for a long time. Well, Carrie says that she was terrified as a child knowing that her neighbor down the street, Marine Hedge, had been murdered. And you had no idea the person that had done the murder was at your dinner table on your couch sitting with you no. the whole time. You, you had no idea about that, no. but you were afraid in your own neighborhood. Yeah, I was six, and it really affected me. And like we think it actually even led to night terrors that I still deal with now. Okay. All right, let's take a look. In April 1985, Marine Hedge disappears. She lives in the same block as Dennis Rader. I very carefully snuck into the house, I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. I moved her to the trunk of the car. She was already dead, so I took uh, pictures of her in different forms of bondage. Police find Hedge's body the next week. What goes through your mind when you see that? He clicks over and he's very cold and callous. Did you hear that? When he's like, well, she was already dead. Like, that's a very cold, callous, calculating person, and I don't know that man. Yeah, some say that he was more BTK than he was Dennis. You say he was more Dennis than he was BTK. Right. I mean, the de like the detectives that have interviewed and solved his case that he's 90, 95% BTK and a little bit Dennis, and I argue it's the other way around. He's 90, 95% my dad and 5% a man I don't know, because if I knew that man, I wouldn't be alive. But the two of you shared an interest in true crime and, and killer movies. Do you think that he was sharing those things with you in some kind of bizarre sort of way? Because think about this, here's a man that's out doing this, he's mm -hmm. out killing people, and he's coming home to his daughter and saying, Let's go watch Silence of the Lambs. Right. In hindsight, I feel like maybe he was trying to share something with me because we were very close and maybe wanting me to understand what was wrong with him. And you still see it today when he writes me. But part of the reason I wrote this book is to say, look, like we're not catching these guys quick enough because they look normal, because they are normal. You know, they can be loving, caring, but they're also psychopathic. And we're not catching him quick enough because we're not we're only looking for the psychopaths. We're not looking for the guy that never even got a speeding ticket. Well, Carrie says her father sent her some unusual things from behind bars. We're going to talk more about that after the break. You will always be my baby girl, and the dark side took me away. And he wrote that a month after he pled guilty to 10 murders, including two children. Carrie is the daughter of Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK serial killer, and reveals what it was like growing up with him in her book, A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Faith, Love, and Overcoming. And when, when you're saying that, that your father uh, is more the, the loving father than he was the serial killer, but when he's taking you to these movies and focusing on this, I have to tell you, from a psychological perspective, that seems to me to be really perverse. Right. He knew he had been in people's houses, choked mm -hmm. the life out of them, taken them from their families, and then he says, let's go entertain myself and entertain right. my daughter by watching this glorified on the screen. And to sit there and share that with you, to me, is beyond psychopathic. That is beyond perverse to do that. Well, I mean, he's a certified sexual sadistic psychopath that we know now, and then he's extremely narcissistic. So I didn't see the narcissism, and I didn't see the psychotic, except, like I said, with my brother. I didn't see the sexual sadist, but I totally agree with you, and I think, like, a criminologist would agree with you, too, that he was sort of getting a high off of like his secret pleasure, let's go get some popcorn and share popcorn and pop. And he's sitting there, you know, like you said, and I think that's very insightful. And I would agree with that. Now, Dennis Rader has shared several letters with Carrie since his arrest in 2005. And Carrie told our producers that she has never read her father's letters publicly before. And we're going to take a look at a, a few excerpts from these letters. And this is one that 
came out in 2005. This is yes. something he wrote to you in 2005. After the plea before the sentencing, this is my dad. I want you to know I do not hate you or don't love you. The problems I have are far away from family love. I know they hurt, and hopefully someday your heart will mend and you can forgive me. You will always be my baby girl I raised right proud, independent, and now as a grown adult with many years of love to give. I'm so glad we had that family vacation in May of 2004. So many memories. Life before the arrest was a good time, and the dark side took me away. And he wrote that a month after he pled guilty to 10 murders, including two children. And I didn't talk to him for two years after the sentencing. Mm -hmm. What was your emotion when, when you read those? Was that like I've got a, a flash of my father coming through? Or was it sadness? Was it anger? Was it betrayal? What, what was the emotion? I'm feeling sad because he's talking about me being his baby girl. And I, I lost my father in 2005. I, and I've had to grieve the loss of this massively important man. And, but then the whole world says, you don't get to grieve this man and you don't get to love him because he's not, he's not lovable and he's evil and you don't have the right to talk about him. And people do not understand that I don't know BTK. I know my dad. Well, he wrote to you on July 24th of 05 and there's a letter that Carrie shared in her book that she says her father sent during the summer after he was arrested. And it says, Dear Carrie, forgive me for missing your wedding anniversary on July 26. I had it marked down and meant well, but didn't get it done. So this card made by another inmate cost me a Snickers bar will be the wish. <laughs> this Sunday p.m. after supper, I'm in my room with a fresh cup of coffee and finishing letters and correspondence. The lean on the house has caused a wedge between me and the defense. They mention nothing of this early as we try to make a decision on non-guilty or plea. I wanted mom out of harm from the onset. I cooperated with the police. I cooperated with the court to save taxpayers millions and family wishes on plea. And then they screw me with a lien. It's out of my hand. I'm still very upset and trust no one in the legal world anymore. Yeah. Um, he's... He's... You're, that's a brick wall of insanity that I've been living with and writing to the last... That's what you're getting. He's offended here. And then he said something that really upset you. Uh, he said, my family were social contacts and pawns in my game. So when I heard that at the sentencing, that's when the final, like, wall slammed down and I was like like he could rot in hell. Well, Carrie says she never asked to be a part of the serial killer kid club and wants to know how to get rid of her anxiety. Uh, I want to talk about that question when we come back. You can see that above the line, it's normal things are going on, going to the lake and camping, and below the line, he's destroying people's lives. Closed captioning provided by... I'm Carrie Rawson, the daughter of Dennis Rader, otherwise known as the BTK serial killer who murdered 10 innocent people, including two children. Today, I live with anxiety and depression and PTSD. I'm a crime victim from before I was born. This is my reality. I'd do anything to not be the daughter of a serial killer, but I am. Well, Carrie Rawson is the author of the book, A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Faith, Love, and Overcoming. And, you know, we put together a timeline, and I'm calling it Milestones Versus Murders, because if you look at it, um, above the line are all the normal things that are dad. Uh, your mother gets pregnant with you, then fishing with you at a Kansas lake, decorating the Christmas tree, family trip to Chicago. And then while a lot of this is going on, below the line, killing a family of four, right. killing a woman that lives alone, Nancy Fox is strangled with a belt, uh, Maureen Hedge is strangled uh, with his hands. I mean, it just goes on and then 
while these things are happening above the line, uh, yes, normal things are going on. So your experience is going to the lake and camping and taking a family trip. And below the line, he's destroying people's lives, destroying families, which you have no knowledge of. And, and you can see, uh, you know, decorating the Christmas tree here, Yellowstone, Colorado River, all of these things that are so normal and natural in, in your life. Uh, right up until he's arrested in 05. And then you say he makes this comment to the detectives when he's arrested that, that you're just social contacts and pawns in his game. You stopped talking to him for two years. Why did you start back? I ended up in trauma therapy, and she's the one that encouraged me to write my dad because she thought it would help heal me. Do you think that your father has genuine remorse for what he's done to you, the uh. betrayal of you? Early on, it was more, it seemed like he was sorry that he had been caught, you know, or that he was sorry because he didn't have his house shoes, or he was sorry because his food stinks. Occasionally, you, that sanity will break in. Um, after the sentencing, he wrote me and he said he was so sorry for the victims, and he asked God to be between him and them. But that's about the closest he's ever got to remorse. So you only get through, if you get through, you only get through for a tiny bit. Have you had hate mail? Have you had people hating on you? Um, yeah, like still today, my book just came out yesterday. And today you could go on to my public Facebook and they're telling me I don't have the right to be a victim. I don't have the right to suffer. I didn't go through anything traumatic. These are strangers today like that come on and just blast these things at me. What would you say to families that would say you are trying to profit from and capitalize on their pain and loss by writing a book for money. I didn't speak to the media for 10 years. And when I finally started speaking up, I realized that only in speaking up was I able to heal in a way I wasn't able to in therapy. And I was tired of being ashamed. I was tired of hiding. I was tired of suffering. Mm -hmm. So this, this is my story, and I have the right to tell it. You wouldn't trust him. No, oh, God, no. I'm also scared to death of him. And you still have night terrors now. I, yeah, I had one last night. I thought there was a man there to strangle me. Closed captioning provided by... You know, he sent you birthday cards from time to mm -hmm. time. Okay, this is 18. Yeah. Okay, and then you have some from 05 yep. mm -hmm. all the way. He sent them intermittently. He knew we had gotten kittens in 05. Mm -hmm. And the creepy thing about that one is it's actually the right layout to where my cat would have been sitting on the couch. I never knew how he knew that. A lot of these have teeth in them in kind of unusual ways, like this one that is pretty bizarre. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's mild for my dad compared to what's out there publicly as what he did as BTK. But that's pretty bizarre to send me. And then he wanted me to frame it and put it on my wall. And I was like, thanks, dad, but no thanks. If he were out today, do you think he would kill again? Um, yeah, because he had gaps. He had a gap between 77 and 85. And he said he got busy raising kids. And he just was busy being a father. But he also became occupied. He would try to he would try to stop, and he would try to occupy himself with things like gardening. And he would get really obsessed. Like he built us a massive treehouse, and later on, he was really obsessed with stamps. And in hindsight, I could see where he was trying to keep himself occupied from all the other stuff. So if he were to get out today, he's 73. I don't think he would physically be able to, but I think he would have the desire to because he. He so was planning one. Him. Oh God, no! I mean, he was still pla he was planning one right before he was arrested. On one hand, he's my dad, but I'm also scared to death of him. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty messed up still. And you still have night terrors now. I yeah, I had one last night here in the hotel. I thought there was a man in my curtains there to strangle me. This has to be cathartic for you mm -hmm. to do this, and the biggest mistake that you can make is to internalize this. And the best device you can have is to give your feelings a voice. Mm -hmm. Because if you internalize it and, and you, you withdraw and isolate with it, then it can eat you up from it's the it, inside out. Your it's life true. was above the line. Right. 
His life was below the line. You never dipped below that line. Live above the line. Talk about it. Give it a voice and keep it out there. Don't ever internalize this or leach right. your life. And, and, and I, internal, I really was that little girl internalizing this, this thing. Like I would tell my mom when I woke up with night terrors when I was <clears> little, I said, there's a bad man in my house. And she goes, there's no bad man here. So you end up in trauma therapy and you don't tell anybody for 10 years because you're like the child of a monster now publicly. You weren't BTK's daughter, you were Dennis's daughter. And it's okay to feel betrayed, it's okay to feel anger, it's okay to have mixed emotions. You know, we have pivotal people in our lives. All of us have pivotal people. Everybody here has at least five pivotal people in their lives. And usually those pivotal people are not all positive or all negative. He is definitely a pivotal person in your life. That doesn't mean it was 100% negative for you. You can hate what he did. Mm. You can hate what he became. You can hate the evil he visited on people. But that doesn't mean you can't remember him baiting your hook at the lake in Kansas. Yeah. You do have that memory, and, right. and that's something that will, it will make you insane if you try to deny that because that was part of your existence. Listen, Carrie's book, it's a serial killer's daughter, and it's a story of faith, love, and overcoming. Overcoming is going to be a process for her the rest of her life. It is a fascinating read. I think you will learn a lot from it about how to overcome things in your life and how to really take a different look at those in your orbit in your life. So I, I, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of her soul in here. There's a lot of her pain in here, but it is an interesting read. So, Carrie, thank you, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Next, we're going to meet a woman who says she comes from a town where some residents fear there may be a serial killer, and she wants answers as her daughter and husband are victims in some of the crimes. We're going to talk to them next. We'll be right back. July 3rd, 2015, the last day anyone reported seeing Crystal Rogers. The Nelson County Sheriff named Rogers' boyfriend, Brooks Houck, a suspect in her disappearance. My whole family's name is, is trashed for something that's completely not even tied to me. Bardstown, Kentucky was once chosen as the most beautiful small town in America by Rand McNally. USA Today Best of the Road contest with its lush, beautiful green landscape, good, hardworking people, delicious food, and of course, it's known for its bourbon. This is Crystal, who lived in this scenic town her whole life and enjoyed the town so much, she planned to never leave. That's why her family and friends thought it was strange that she vanished during the 4th of July weekend in 2015. To this day, her mom, Sherry, hasn't given up the search. July 3rd, 2015, the last day anyone reported seeing or hearing from Crystal Rogers. Her parents, Tommy and Sherry Ballard, knew something was wrong when they couldn't get a hold of their daughter. The next day, investigators say the 35-year-old's car was found abandoned on the side of a bluegrass parkway. The car was unlocked. It had her purse and phone in the seat, and her keys were still in it. She had a flat tire. The Nelson County Sheriff named Rogers' boyfriend, Brooks Houck, a suspect in her disappearance, saying Rogers was likely dead. Dead. At the time, investigators released video of an interview with Houck days after his girlfriend was reported missing. He denied any involvement. My whole family's name is, is trashed for something that's completely not even tied to me. His brother, Nick Houck, was also fired from the Bardstown Police Department, accused of interfering with the investigation. An interview with the officer shows Nick Houck's reaction after an FBI polygraph examiner says he failed a test. I don't give a computer said, okay? Thank you, dude. I'm telling you that I have been 100% honest with you. The Ballards have asked the community to put up pink balloons to keep the name Crystal Rogers on everyone's mind. Hopeful someone out there with some key information will do the right thing. I mean, I don't know what to tell our kids. I can't tell them she's not coming back because I can't prove to them that she's not.
And then while Sherry and her husband Tommy were desperately searching all over Bardstown for their daughter, for Crystal, another unspeakable incident happened in Bardstown. Tommy Ballard was shot in the chest Saturday morning just before 8 a.m. while hunting with relatives on family property. Ballard was widely known in Nelson County for relentlessly searching for his daughter, Crystal Rogers. The hardest is knowing she's out there. Three questions remain unanswered by authorities. Who pulled the trigger? Was it an accident or a murder? And is Tommy Ballard's killing in any way tied to the disappearance of his daughter, Crystal Rogers? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to meet you. I'm sorry for the circumstance. I Thank wish we were you. talking about a thousand other things. Um, but I'm, I'm doing this because I want to keep a bright light on over this story. I want to keep it on everybody's mind. Somebody knows something, and maybe this will cause them to say something. Do you think the two cases are linked? Yes, 100%. Every news article we ever did, we said we would never give up looking for our daughter. And I think they thought the searches would stop, and I think it would just been easier for the killer if my husband was not in the picture. Well, and, and I'm very sorry for your loss about your Thank husband, you. of course. So what you believe is that whoever is involved in the disappearance of your daughter wanted to stop your husband's relentless search for her. So when he was out hunting, they just got in a position to take a shot and shot and killed him then to stop him from searching. Yes, so sir. you think they're linked in that way? Yes, sir. Since Sherry has been searching for answers, I wanted to reach out to former FBI criminal profiler and host of Investigation Discovery's Deadly Women. Uh, she's a good friend of mine, a good friend of the show's, and I think one of the wisest uh, people when it comes to deconstructing these things that I've encountered in my 45 years in this business. I'm talking about Candace DeLong. Candace, you've looked into this. Help us think through this. What what do we need to think about? What What's to be looked at here? Well, we were talking about Tom's death. He was out in a field. There were trees off to the distance. He was plainly visible to whoever shot him, and he was shot in the chest. Center mass. Center mass. Tells me it probably was not an accident. I think it's a, pre, uh, a premeditated murder. And whoever shot him was a very skilled, um, uh, skilled at firearms. Are these two cases related? She thinks they are. I believe they are as well. One is missing, the other one's looking for the missing daughter, and he's murdered, and it is a murder in my opinion. Uh, the, the odds of that not being connected to are probably astronomical. However, I think there's a reason that he was shot and killed in that open field. The shooter was sending a message to you and uh, to anyone else who's sticking their nose into the case of Crystal to find out where she is. Fortunately for you, all of this publicity will help keep you safe. And let me say to all of you, if you have any information about the disappearance, of Crystal Rogers, any information about the shooting death of Tommy Ballard, please contact the Nelson County Police Department at 502-348-1840. We're going to have these numbers. You're seeing them on the bottom of the screen right now. They'll be on uh, drphil.com. Uh, so they'll be easy to find. I'll put them on my Twitter account. I'll put them on Facebook. I'll put them on Instagram. I'll put them everywhere you can find me. That number's going to be there. Uh, so if you know something, however small, please let us know. Closed captioning provided by... How many of you are right where you wanted to be when you started out as an adult in your life and said, I got a plan? How many of you are right where you wanted to be? Raise your hand. Okay, that's like 5%. <laughs> How many of you are not where you wanted to be when you started out? Okay, that's almost everybody. <laughs> Would you agree with the statement that life gets in the way? Yes. If there's one theme that I get 
from people more than anything is that I had a plan and life got in the way. I was going to do this someday. But then you go look on your calendar and there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Someday's not on there. You look and look and it's just not in there. But what if I told you that I could help give you an edge in your life that would give you a second bite at the apple? And let me tell you why that's important. I have talked to so many people that spent their life working for what they did not want. And that's why I'm doing this series that I was telling y'all about on my podcast, Fill in the Blanks, called Living by Design. Because I think we should live on purpose. And I want you to figure out who you are and how you got there. Have you ever asked yourself how you got to be the person you are as you sit there in that chair right now today? If I handed out pieces of paper right now, how many of you think you could write down your definition of success with great detail? Wow, that's less than 10% of you could write down what success is in your life in great detail. Is that surprising to you? I've spent my life studying people that are champions. And you ask them, what is success? A lot of people say, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I'll jinx myself. Not these people. These people say, oh, I can tell you. I can tell you exactly what it is. I can tell you what I'm going to be wearing. I can tell you what it's going to smell like in the room. I can tell you who's going to be there. They can define it with such detail. It's like a laser bomb. Zzz, boom. They know exactly what they're after. And I'm devoting this week's entire podcast to showing you how you can design your life. And it starts this whole series. So you guys all got your phones out, right? All right, go to your calendar, and I want you to go to one year from today and circle that, because one year from now, I want you to remember us having this conversation. One year from today, your life is going to be better or worse than it is today. And a big part of whether it's going to be better or worse is a function of the choices you're going to make between now and then. And here's the problem. Once I've said this to you, you cannot not choose. Because not choosing is a choice. Then make sure you listen and enjoy. And remember, when this date pops up next year, your life is going to be better or worse than it was today. So let's make sure that it's better. Do that. Don't just be reactive. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.